gives me immense pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome on behalf of the Institute of Modern Languages, University of Dhaka, which has clubbed us all here for today's seminar. As you all know, we are privileged today to have Dr. Chris Tang with us as distinguished speaker of today's talk. Okay, let me give you a brief introduction of Dr. Chris Tang. Dr. Chris Tang is a lecturer in international education and teaches on four programs at the School of Education, Communication and Society, King's College London, UK. His research interests center on the development and use of applied linguistic methodology and tools in public health communication, risk and disaster management, communication and language education context, particularly those situated in interlinguistical, in, sorry, in linguistically and culturally diverse environments. So it's quite dynamic as we can observe. Moreover, he has several publications in internationally reported journals such as Applied Linguistics and Journal of Pragmatics. Dr. Chris Sang is also the co-founder and coordinator of the Corpus Research in Linguistics and Beyond Seminar series. In addition to his academic work, he has over 15 years of experience in teaching English as a foreign language. Now, at this point of the program, I want to call upon Dias, Professor Dr. Shishi Bhattacharya Sir, Director of the Institute of Modern Languages, University of Dhaka, to deliver his welcome speech. Sir, please. What we have at the university, the University of University, was a copy of Oxford, a kind of copy, and Oxford was a copy of Paris University, which was established in the 12th century. Okay. In that university, in Paris, for example, there are a bunch of people who used to study for years, sometimes for 20 years. They study today in Paris, then they go to London, then they go to Sweden, then they go to Spain, like this. When their parents used to call them, please come back, get married and have some property here. They used to say, I can have women any, any time I want, but education, if I lose it once, I will not have it again. So this was how university students were in that time Europe. And because of their travel and the travels they took of traveling, uh, little by little uh, knowledge was grown in, in Europe and at the end of, uh, well, I see around 14th, 15th century, there are so many universities in the Europe, and because of this university, there are so many knowledge uh, gathered in Europe that we could do the Renaissance and then uh, Industrial Revolution, and then whatever you see here are really the product of the universities and the people who just invested their life in knowledge business. So now today, uh, today we are in the 21st century and someone from the West, I hope West, at least not by appearance but by nature, I hope. <laughs> so, so he came from the West uh, for talking about something of the East, Sileti diaspora. So coming from the West uh, for talking about something uh, of the East and in front of the people from the East. And that's the very uh, spirit of the university. And I'm very happy about that in our university and our institute today is really fulfilling uh, the goal of the university. And I must thank you, all of you. Uh, there are many I see now, and many others will come, will continue to come, I hope. And I thank all of you. I thank all the uh, uh, guests. And I must thank Chris for this lecture. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much for your welcome speech. Now I'm going to call upon Dias Hamidur Rahman Sar, our supernumerary professor, to deliver his welcome speech on behalf of the English language program. Right. Uh, welcome to Chris Tang. And uh, as I was talking to him before coming here, we, I think we have a connection with King's College. One of our teachers is completing his PhD there. And Chris Tang is here. I did my master's. He did his must, master's here. And also, Chris, Professor, uh, uh, Mr. Chris, Dr. Chris Tribble, 
uh, came here about five years ago to work with me and my, some of my colleagues on a UGC British Council project. And he's here, and I'm sure this connection will grow, and our teachers, our students, there will be future opportunities for involvement in research and other things. So, welcome, Chris Tang. We're all eagerly waiting for, for uh, li listening to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your speech. Now it's time to move on to the core of the seminar. I cordially welcome Dr. Chris Tang, esteemed speaker of today's seminar, to deliver his talk on how to reach the role of the Siliti Bengali diaglossia, orality and multilingualism in promoting public health and community resilience amongst UK Bangladeshis during extreme weather events. During a natural disaster, poor communication can contribute to easily preventable morbidity and mortality, particularly among groups designated as hurt to reach. This talk draws on data from the applied linguistic study looking at communication practices about the health risk of hot and cold weather in an area of London with a predominantly Bangladeshi and white British population. At this point, I want to request Sabrina Ahmed Choudhury, the teacher in charge of English language program, to greet and welcome Dr. Chris Tang with flowers. Welcome in spite of the cricket, because everybody else has been saying that. So thank you for coming. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would have to say, first of all, um, also, because I'm English, I have to apologize. Um, First, I have to apologize for the length of the title of this seminar. Uh, it's very long, um, but hopefully I can unravel that for you. I, sh I should also apologize for my pronunciation of Bengali, okay? And also that if I should happen to have to pronounce a word of this language, um, I will uh, promise to try harder in future. Um, I should also say thank you to all the people who have made me feel uh, so welcome here in Dhaka so far, and also I just have to say, it, it's one of the most beautiful campus universities I've, I've seen, and, and I mean that honestly. It is, it is very, very beautiful. It's a lovely place uh, to be. Uh, and, and the culture you have here is, as I said, it's like a sea, it overwhelms you, okay? So, so without, uh, and that's, 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 so I suppose I should really um, get into what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, before I do that, I'll, I'll introduce and maybe contextualize the research a little bit for you. So. I'm a, a, a lecturer in the School of Education, Communication and Society at King's College London. Now, as a school, um, we are interested in um, promoting knowledge of education for the public good. And when I say education, I mean education in its broadest sense. So education that includes uh, language education. We have an MA TESOL, we have an MA AO and ELT, but also science and math education. And also, far more broadly, language, culture, communication, and public policy. So we're interested in education in terms of promoting health awareness, promoting understanding of risk, okay? Um, so as you can imagine, it's quite an interdisciplinary department um, with linguistics just being um, a small part of a much bigger picture. And, and um, so this is where I fit in. So I've been working on projects on health and, and risk communication within the department uh, with some of my colleagues here. And these are some of the projects we've done recently. Um, one project was on looking at EDCs and PPCPs in drinking water. You probably don't know what they are. They're just types of water contaminants, okay? But they were receiving a lot of media attention in the UK. And we looked at the role of language in amplifying risk perception of these contaminants. It was a sort of health scare. There was no real evidence that they caused harm. But, um, but the newspapers were, were making people quite concerned. And we wanted to take a look at how language was used to, to do that. Um, uh, there was also a recent project looking at uh, a water contamination event. This is a very different type of communication. This is uh, much more like a disaster communication scenario where there's a contaminant has been found, you can't drink the water now, you have to take action immediately, right? And that's a very, it's very important to get effective and timely communication across to the people at risk in that scenario. So it's a different type of situation, but we also looked at how language was used in that case. Um, a colleague of mine, Olivia Napton, has, has looked at um, um, recorded experiences of obsessive compulsive disorder. So she looked at the language used by patients who have this disorder, um, and from this analysis is able to provide insights into making improvements to the therapy um, 
that these people receive. Okay? And the project I'm going to talk to you about today, the focus was on extreme temperature, so extreme heat and cold. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in, in, um, in, in health communication in complex linguistic and cultural scenarios, such as in ethnic minority contexts in the UK. Um, so so um, as you can see from that, um, we are very much interested in, uh, when we start doing applied linguistic research in health, we're thinking about linguistics that has implications for improving health outcomes. That's important. There's a practical, real-world implication of what we do. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, now. Before that, though, I'd like to give you just a heads up in terms of the methodology. I won't spend time, much time on this. I'm aware that there might, might be some non-linguists in the room, so I won't talk too much about this. Um, but one of the, the methods that, that we've used, and I've used, is corpus linguistics. Now, if you're not aware of corpus linguistics, I'll give you this quote from one of the fathers of corpus linguistics, um, Sinclair. Okay? So it's basically the use of software to analyze a collection of naturally occurring language text in electronic form, selected according to external criteria to represent, as far as possible, a language or language variety as a source of data for linguistic research. So that's a big mouthful. So essentially, it means you decide what type of language you're interested in. You collect data, a lot of data, on that language. You make sure it's digitally readable, right? and you use software to analyze it. And when you analyze it, you're looking initially for broad quantitative patterns. So what types of words, for instance, are the most frequent? Right? And a basic, and a basic analysis. Right? And then you can actually get, a, uh, you then you start thinking about, OK, so these words are very frequent. How are they being used? And you can use the software to get an idea about their discourse functionality. Okay? And this is very useful in, in, uh, when we're looking about health communication, because we can collect a lot of data on a particular health risk and take a look at what language is being used to represent that risk. Okay. The other method, um, a methodology, I should say, really, uh, draw upon, is um, a set of theories known um, as cognitive linguistics. Now, I'm not even going to attempt to explain cognitive linguistics, because there's uh, hundreds of different theories that it encompasses. But they all share an interest in explaining the relationship between language, thought, physical, and social experience. Now, I'll give you some examples okay, of what I mean by that. Okay? And perhaps I can do that. Uh, to do that, you can help me a little bit because uh, I can give you a sort of cross-cultural test. Okay, so I want you to think um, about whether whether you would give the word if you're thinking about happiness, right? Happiness, and if you had to describe happiness as a direction, if you had to describe happiness, happy, the state of being happy, is it up or is it down? Up, up or down? Up, right? Okay, it's also for me, up. Uh, what about what about good? If you had to give direction to good, is good up or down? Up, right? Okay, so bad is down. What about more? Is more up or down? What's going on? Right? We're having this this shared conceptualization of uh, that the directionality up and down maps onto an abstract concept like happiness or quantity, right? Um, and this is something uh, that cognitive linguists are very interested in. These um, shared experiences of the world, right? Why would happiness be up? I don't know. If we look at humans, when they smile, their, their, their smiles go up, right? Okay? When, when you, why would more be up, right? Well, when you start piling things on top of each other, they get higher, right? We see that from a very early experience of the world. So, essentially, we're talking about conceptualization to the universal in nature. It's pretty useful for communication if you can understand those types of conceptualizations, how they're enacted. What's also important is their relationship to language. If we look at the English language, we find that a lot of the language we use is structured by these types of conceptualization. I'm feeling a bit down. Yeah. My mood lifted. She'll rise to the top. Top is good. Bad is down. The money I make here each year is growing up. Okay. So this is another methodology that I draw upon. Okay, um, I won't. I, we'll talk about it. I'll draw upon it a little bit in today's lecture, but it's very, very useful for getting an insight into communication, particularly in cross-cultural communication circumstances, where you want to get an understanding of universal conceptualizations like directionality and how that applies to generate a universal understanding of risk. Okay, so today we're going to be focusing specifically on um, applied linguistic methods. Um, in relation to health 
and disaster literacy in linguistically and culturally diverse contexts. Okay, I sort of explained, and I'll unpack what I mean by health literacy in a minute. Um, I would say, um, actually, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, specifically, I'll be drawing on a project where I looked, assessed the health literacy of Bangladeshi and white British people in a London borough in relation to communication about extreme temperature. Okay, and then after I've discussed the, the data from that project a little bit, we'll talk about the implications for health communication and disaster preparedness in multilingual communities. Okay, um, so. Um, let me just start by unpacking health literacy a bit for you. So health literacy might be a new concept for some of you, I understand that. It's actually been around for a while, it's quite recent. Um, it's not, it's not, it, it's originally about 10, 15 years ago, it started becoming quite prominent in, in health communication research because they, they associated, and originally it was very narrowly defined as a set of numeracy and literacy skills you need to access health information. So it's the stuff you need, it's the language skills you need to read a prescription, and the numerous skills you need to know how often you're supposed to take the medication, right? So that was the original narrow definition of health literacy. And what they started discovering is that when we promote health literacy, when health literacy is high, um, less people die, right? So we improve health outcomes, whether people die or whether they don't die, whether they get sick or whether they don't sick, by promoting awareness of health. And that makes sense. That makes sense, because if we promote awareness of health, people understand what actions to take in terms of risk. They mitigate against risk, and they, do, and they, and they have better health. Right? But what's happened then since then is that there's been a lot of research, a lot of research, exponentially, 10 times the studies that originally were being done have been conducted per year now. Um, and that's included um, a theoretical as well as an empirical expansion. So um, we understand now that health literacy is a little bit more complicated than just literacy and numeracy. It's not just about whether you can read and write in a language and, calculate and, and be able to add up in a language, right? It's also about the right, a far wider range of communicative skills required to understand health information and apply it in a way that is beneficial to your health and to the health of others, okay? So one conceptualization is health literacy as a process. So first of all, you need the skills to access the information in the first place. Okay, um, then you need to understand it, <laughs> appraise the, the information, evaluate it in ways that are meaningful for you and for others, and then apply it in the right way. Okay? We can see it as a process. We can also see it as a hierarchy. Right? We can see the functional skills at the bottom, so literacy and numeracy and language skills. Right? Um, and then further up, we have communicative skills, a broader repertoire of communicative skills required to get information and to communicate information to others, to interact with others. We need to be able to do this. Um, and at the top, we have uh, a, a critical dimension to health literacy, uh, the ability to see yourself um, as an agent of change within your community for improving health outcomes, the ability to evaluate uh, a source of information, right, and decide, mm, is this source reliable, Should I, is this relevant to me, okay? So, so it's a much more complex concept than just numbers and literacy. Now, I, my preferred way of looking at it is a practitioner's viewpoint. Um, Okay, so we can take a look at history, we can also take a look at health literacy as an interaction, particularly when we assess it, an interaction between individual capacities to access information in the health system and the system itself. How complicated is the system, right? So if you make a very complicated system, it's going to be a lot harder to access for individuals. If we're talking about communication, uh, we're talking about the capacities for interpretation interacting with the message design. How difficult is your message, your health message, your warning message, how difficult is it to understand, okay? And when we start thinking about health literacy measurement, we need to see it as this interactivity, right? It's not just about transmitting knowledge from my mind into yours, right? It is an interactivity, right? You might be able to understand more or less depending on how I frame what it is uh, that I'm saying. One problem with this, it sounds great, health literacy, doesn't it? But from a linguistics perspective, they neglected language. All of this, right? Because what tends language to be seen as a language barrier. They talk about language as a barrier, right, to communication. So if there's a language barrier, your health literacy is lower. Or low language proficiency is a variable, right? So low language proficiency individuals have correlate with low health literacy, right? So it's abstracted. You know, we don't know. You know, there's, 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 there's so much more language than just life as a variable. Barrier. Um, 
And in the tests of health literacy, we also see the reflective. They're more task-based. Can they do a task? Can they read? Did they read and understand? Right? But not why did they read and understand? What are the impact of language choices on whether they read and understand uh, a particular type of text? Right? And this is an example. Um, this is a health literacy test which they give to people in hospitals um, to quickly triage patients into whether they need an interpreter or not. Right? Um, and they're also given to, to, to um, English speakers as well. Right? And, and it's simple vocabulary tests, a list of different vocab words that are health in a health context uh, with increasing um, degree of lexical formality and complexity. So we start with behavior, most people understand behavior, and then we end with jaundice, which is a bit more specific. And, and, and they just administer it uh, by saying, OK, behavior, do you understand it? Do you sort of understand it? Do you not understand it? And they tick off those boxes accordingly, okay, and give you a score. So again, we can see that that's a limited test, isn't it? Right? It's just saying, do you understand or don't understand? Don't you understand? There's no sort of engagement with why do you understand? Why, what would you be able to understand better? So this is where I'm coming from, okay? Um, I'm interested in in developing in investigating language as a complex interactivity between language demands of a message and uh, the capacities of individuals to interpret that message. Uh, and this is an example, um, a rare example actually, of, of culturally tailored communication to the Bangladeshi diaspora in the UK. And obviously it's trying to communicate about strokes. And what strikes me about this um, um, poster is, is, um, is the fact that the message is, is making all of these assumptions about the Bangladeshi community it's designed to appeal to. It's assuming that they have multilingual knowledge. We can notice that there are two languages on this poster, right? English and Bengali. Um, we also, for me, it also seems to be assumed that their knowledge of those languages is um, variable because we don't see much syntax. Um, a lot of the processes involved in, in getting a stroke, right? Um, your face sagging and uh, losing control, mobility and so on, that's all to communicate it by images. And instead, we have a word face in two scripts, right? Okay. The fact that there are two scripts is also interesting. Yeah? So maybe they're, they're assuming different levels of literacy on the part of participants. Okay? Um, so, and, and in a way, right, they're, they're sort of right, right. A lot of the studies of the Bangladeshi diaspora find that um, a lot of the older generation, particularly, um, speak primarily Sileti, which, as you, I'm sure you know, is primarily now an oral language. Some of them don't have literacy in either or limited literacy in Bengali and in English, um, and limited English language proficiency. Okay? So there does seem to be some sort of connection there. Okay? What we don't know, just from speculating like this, is what, what they understood from this poster, how they interacted with this poster, whether they got something for this, whether it persuaded them, whether they took action. Okay? And that's the sort of research that I want to do. Okay, to take a look at how people engage with these different types of language. Now, the study that, uh, that I looked at is, um, is looking at um, extreme temperature in the UK. Now, that, I know, might seem like a contradiction in terms. Right? Okay? England is not known for its extreme temperature. But that's the problem, isn't it? Right? If, if it becomes very hot in the UK, or very cold, we aren't prepared. People aren't used to it. More is up, less is down. Um, it's not quite at the top, it's near the top. Right? So they have a more nuanced understanding of the risk scenario. It's just below serious. Right? Um, some misinterpretations. So numbers, you can either read with a magnitude included, so four can be at the top, or you can read it as ordinal. So some people thought one meant it was, uh, one was the highest alert, and three was somewhere in the middle. Okay? So there were some misinterpretations. Okay? So we have this triangulation, in a way, for the cognitive task. So, what I'd like to move on now to now is to discuss the results of the um, Soleti assessment. I'm wary, but I'm running a bit out of time here, so I'm going to try and move things along. Okay? So, um, so, this required um, a degree of adaptation, um, and I made a classic mistake. What I did was I, I did what a lot of people do in these scenarios. I just decided to ask a translation agency to translate the materials into Soleti. This was a silly idea. Okay? The translation agency um, translated the English text into Bengali, and then from the Bengali text, they translated it into Soleti, but using an, an English script. And when I gave it to the community-based researchers who were going to work with me on the groups, they said, this is nonsense. We can't read it. Okay? Um, so I realized 
that this approach, and this is often the approach taken in health communication in ethnic minority communities, just translate, they'll understand it. No, they won't. Um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this was a, 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 a bad idea. So what I did instead is I opted for a, a more open dialogue approach, um, working together with the community researchers to develop our translators by discussing the English language and suggesting different options. Right? This got me closer to uh, the differences between Saleti and, and, and English and Bengali um, and, and helped develop um, translation, translated text or an assessment text that had a greater sensitivity to the capacities of the older Bangladeshi participants in the assessment to interpret the language. Okay? Um, so what we ended up doing is we adapted all of the, the, the written text into spoken texts. They will all be spoken. There were two Bengali texts okay? um, and an English text which I retained, but they were all uh, framed as radio broadcasts. So they were played for the participants and they were asked to interact with them. Um, and there was also a Saleti text. Now, for the Saleti text, I hired a young person from the community um, who was fluent in both Saleti and English to read one of the English texts a couple of times and, and then spontaneously um, mediate that message, to interpret that message as if he was talking to an older relative. Okay, and I recorded that and played it for participants. So they had four different texts, okay? So what was the result? Crazy stuff, okay? Um, so one of the things we asked them to do is, um, okay, which text did you understand the most? Now, I thought, okay, there's a Saleti text, they will understand the Saleti text the most. But they all said, no, no, we understand the Bengali text, that's all very clear, okay? But the Saleti recording um, was actually um, less clear than the Bengali recording, so that was surprising. The fact that they assessed the English recording as being difficult to follow um, uh, made sense. They, 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 we expected them not to understand much of that, and that seemed to be the case. Okay? But when we also compare it um, to their actual recall of information, right, um, we have actually a higher level of inaccuracy when they were recording the Bengali recording. And they also showed, when they were talking about the Bengali and English recording, a lot high level of embellishment. So what they used to talk, they, they started talking about things that weren't in the recording. Oh yes, when it's cold, you should put um, chains on your car. It's very important. That wasn't mentioned. Oh, you should take a shower. That wasn't mentioned. Okay? So, um, so this doesn't seem to match up. So what's going on? Okay? Well, when we probed them a little bit on Bengali, it seemed that um, not only did they not recall detail with so much accuracy, they also uh, um, um, and, and, and embellish information. They also tended to, to misinterpret some of the information. And this tended to be for these more scientific types of term, well, terms like the term for heat wave, right? Um, and the term for stroke, right? They would understand, but they wouldn't understand, they didn't understand heat stroke. But uh, the general um, tendency here was that it was more likely to understand English rather than the Bengali terms, presumably because they've been in the country for so long. Okay? There were also, um, uh, grammatical misinterpretations, um, particularly in a type of sentence which you'd find in a, in, in, a, in a heavy nominalized sentence that you'd find in scientific discourse. So a probability of the lowest temperatures in the UK since 2012 is the translation. Okay? So they misinterpret that. And that's a lot of information packaged in that sentence. So that maybe made it more difficult for them to unpackage. We have to remember that they are primarily reliant on Saleti, which doesn't have these abstractions, these grammatical abstractions. Um, when it came to interpreting um, um, uh, the warning message. So we kept some of this message in English because uh, the, the community researchers advised that they would be more likely to be persuaded by these, these terms if we kept them in English, but we used uh, the word for alert. Um, and, and they tended to interpret these holistically, right? So they just saw that they ignored the level three in the amber. It's a bit like the cognitive task, and they just focused on it being a warning, right? Um, they also uh, talked about the warning being, um, there were some evidence of scolarity, right? So this, this gentleman here talks about yellow being a little less and amber is above, but the focus was more on the colors, right? So yellow was above because it's darker, was, is less, is less dark. So yellow is below because it's less dark, amber is above because it's darker. So they weren't mapping the colors onto risk. Um, the only color associations they drew was traffic lights, right? Amber means mild, it means stop. Right? And traffic lights are a category system, they're not a scale system, so it's very different. So again, this, this type of conceptual abstraction was not really very familiar for them. Okay? So what's going on? Well, potentially, right, uh, we, English language studies 
looking at reading comprehension, t have noted a similar tendency for uh, students to uh, over-assess their ability to understand. Okay? So perhaps um, because they didn't have a full resource, linguistic resource in Bengali, they, weren't a, they, they misjudged their comprehension of it. Okay? Um, and this, we can read their use of their embellishment from background knowledge as a potential coping strategy. Okay, maybe they used the background or they couldn't understand it, so they drew upon their knowledge of what to do in cold weather to help interpret the text. And they did the same thing, uh, um, and, and the other tendency I haven't talked about, so I won't discuss that here, but they also focused on detail a lot, which is a very common strategy in English language, in the English language class. A lot of um, ESOL learners um, focus on that as well. So perhaps this was a, a, a something to do with this. Okay? But why did they, why was the, the Saleti recording so unclear? Okay. Well, um, what we can see on the left is the origin, an excerpt from the original text that Kamal, a pseudonymed person who, re who translated the text spontaneously, right, uh, talked about. And then we can see in this text we have, uh, we have complex scientific terms. We have terms like heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Right? Um, and this is also very well orchestrated and were pre-structured. It's written discourse, right? We have a sentence on the health conditions followed by a sentence on the symptoms, separated out. And the symptoms are also nouns, yeah? D uh, or adjectives, dizzy, short of breath, nausea, vomiting, right? This is um, grammatical abstraction that we find in scientific language. But Saleti, not only did Kamal have to repackage that, re-encode it in Saleti, he had to um, he had to re he realized that, that Saleti doesn't have the same resource. It doesn't you do these types of things, right? So if we look at his um, his reenactment of the of the text, right? He talks about um, the text as being um, uh, uh, we see this choreographed sentence structure, right? So each sentence leads into the next, rather than health conditions and health symptoms, we have, how is it harmful? You'll feel more thirst for water more. Your head will spin. You'll feel like throwing up. You may get heat stroke, right? We have this repetition. One sentence prepares the next. There's no pre-structuring. Um, so on the one hand, something is lost, right? Something becomes a bit more confusing, perhaps, to, 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 to listen to something like that. On the other hand, what he is doing, right? And we have to remember that they record this text with the most accuracy. Um, he is unpacking all the nouns, right? Dizzy becomes your head will spin. He's making the noun situational. Nausea, a noun, becomes a verb. You will feel like throwing up, right? And when, the, when he doesn't know, he did, maybe he didn't understand heat stroke, he certainly didn't know a term or how to, the, the symptoms of heat stroke in, in Saleti, so he just uses the English term. So when the resource in Saleti wasn't there, he draws upon the English, okay? And this says something about how they were engaging with this type of language, okay? Oh, I need to wrap up, I think. Don't I? Okay, so so I'm going to, to, to rush on a little bit, okay, and talk about um, evidence for, for for I mean, okay. So one of the things that we can we can conclude about this, right, is that perhaps coming from an oral language, um, there is a different. All the Bangladeshis are bringing a different type of conceptualization to risk. All oral cultures have been found to have a much more situational understanding of risk. Something that's based into what happens to who and when. And we see this all the way in the cognitive class, and we see it in, in the, uh, uh, um, as we see it in, in the, 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 the text-based assessment as well. Right? We see a tendency to interpret text holistically. We see a, a reliance on prior canonical knowledge and embellishing beyond the text. Right? Going back to the canon, yeah? oral cultures share knowledge. Right? Um, we also see evidence of non-abstract categorization of colors and risk preference for situational framings of risk, right? um, um, and an uncriticality and tendency to positively appraise text. There's a different way that, 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 uh, that evaluation, critical evaluation is more about the person telling the story rather than the actual story itself. Okay? Um, I won't um, look at that slide okay, for timing reasons. So we can summarize all of this as um, um, we can summarize this as a series of interactions, right? We can summarize health literacy from a linguistics perspective as interactions on different levels, okay? So if we look at the, the, the results of the study, we can indicate that there was an interactivity at the level of intelligibility. It depends on the choice of language is important, particularly in multilingual contexts, right? Which language are you choosing 
And also, which mode are you using, spoken or written mode? Right? Um, and this choice will have impact for linguistic knowledge. Right? This will put specific demands on linguistic knowledge. At another level, the level of interpretation, we have an interacting not just between the choice, the language you've chosen, but between specific language choices. Whether you decide to use color to represent, uh, whether you decide to talk about an amber alert, or whether you talk about a uh, heat wave alert, that has implications, okay? Um, because that puts a demand on cultural knowledge, right? In order to interpret that, um, interpret um, cultural abstractions, we need to understand and have experience in that culture. And of course, we also can think about the content. Which semiotics are we going to choose? Is it good to use color as a, in a warning system and levels, tiered warning? Is that a useful system? Is that going to be persuasive? Is that going, how's that going to interact with prior beliefs and perceptions? Right? So risk perceptions are very important. Okay? So this is a model for basing um, linguistic intervention on health literacy on. Okay? Um, so I'm really going to, I'm, I know I'm uh, running over and there might be some questions, so I'm going to speed up and just talk about the implications, final implications, okay? So clearly, a clear, a resounding implication of the study is that warning and scientific understanding of risk, if we're talking to multilingual uh, or, or orally based cultures, require mediation, require people like Kamal to unpack the nouns into verbs, for instance, right? Multilingual resource can be an asset, um, but it also can be a risk, okay? Um, and it's important that we start considering more situational and universal understandings of risks to help communicate the abstractions of science. So we need to start thinking about scalarity as universal, okay? How is that? That's a universal conceptualization, right? But this idea of scale and color is abstract, right? Perhaps we can use scale in a more universal way and just talk about low, medium, and high risk, and that's more universally understandable. It cuts across culture. At the same time, we can also draw upon um, already based communities as a resource, as a linguistic, as a way of get, evolving more situational, universally applicable understandings of risk. We can talk about, uh, we can talk about these sentences like this pouncing heat to talk about heat risk, right? The idea of heat pouncing. This is from the older Bangladeshi in the study. And when I represented this at the, the um, uh, uh, health department, they were fascinated by this. Right? This is a fantastic way of communicating heat risk that suddenly comes upon you and you can't do anything, right? Or it seems like it will rain, but it doesn't. It only feels more hot. That's much more communicative than a red alert, right? Okay, this idea of abnormality is immediately communicated. So I think, I think I'll wrap up there to allow time for questions, okay? Um, I will put up, and I should put up, an acknowledgement slide at the end, okay? Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge um, the Schwedenata Trust, um, um, who are the community organization that helped me um, in the research, as well as an alumnus of, of, this, of this school, of this department, um, Lubavar Nusrat Khalil, who acted not only as a transcriber and translator, but as my co-coder for the, the Sylvetti data. Right? So we discussed and interpreted the findings together. And I can, I can fully attest to the, 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 the standard of your program, because she was excellent, truly really excellent in, uh, a researcher to work with. Uh, and of course, Professor Virginia Murray, who supported and sponsored this uh, research. Okay? So thank you very much. Um, that's all I will have to say. I'll, I'm open for questions now. Hopefully, you have some time. Thank you. Things involved, but of course there are very short of, a lot of shortage of time, so I'm not going to go into that. My one question is, who was the translator? Who translated? What was the identity of the language of the, of the, of the, of the translator? So, um, the, um, for the text translations, mm -hmm. there were um, people who had grown up in the community in, in, um, in Tower Hamlets, so they, they spoke Sileti, but they had also been educated in Bengali. And, um, but they'd grown up um, subsequently in the English education system. So they were familiar with the communicative needs of the, uh, and they'd been working with that community for a long period of time. So they were, um, they, I suppose they would identify as British Bangladeshi. Yeah, my question was, what was the educational level? So, I have done a lot of work with reading. Yes. And I have found that Bangladeshis were with us, we, we, most of our students have a huge problem with reading and interpreting. Right. Uh, so that, that's why I'm asking. Yes. And there's, there's also there's another thing. So, yes. um, Bengali is not considered a um, proper language for, by Sylhet. It's a separate language. 
and I've often heard them saying that I know Silicon, but I don't know Bengali. Yes. Speak to me in English. So right. that, that's what has happened for, with me. But yes, that's what I would like to know, the, the level. Because when you're translating, uh, do they know? Well, how to translate? They're, they're used to doing, so they're, they're, when they've done research in the past, they normally, because uh, they normally have a, an English text and they ad-lib, they translate on the spot. Okay. And, and to some degree that was possible in this research, but not with the texts. So we had to have something pre-prepared. Um, so they had, they had a lot of communicative sensitivity to the needs of the, of the, 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 the people, that, the participants, the research participants, because they've been working with them for many years. So they, and I think that helped. Uh, their education level was high. They, 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 some of them have published works. Um, uh, the other has been working as a community researcher for the last 15 to 20 years at universities within, within the area. So they were, they were highly literate in both languages, although one of them, one of them wasn't literate in Bengali, so he was only literate in English. The other one was literate and was a translator of both. So it was very good to get both of their insights, actually, when we worked together on this. Does it look like more of interpretation to me like that? Translation, actually, um, sort of. So, so for the text, it was translation, but it was with this open dialogue approach. Yeah. So, so, um, so what would happen is somebody would suggest a, a, a suggested translation, and then we would go through it. These texts were quite short, so we could do that. With the on-the-spot focus group moderation, that was all um, prompted by, they had English prompts, and then they would translate during the focus groups. But that was just to ask questions, right? So the, but the texts were... were, were um, not designed to be uh, the same with English text, because they couldn't be. These people had completely different communicative needs. Right? They were representations um, that were designed to elicit a certain type of interaction. We would, wanted to see how would they understand a Bengali health announcement in, if we designed it in Bengali. The answer is they would understand some of it. They would understand other bits they not so well. Right? More abstract, conceptually abstract, grammatically abstract bits, they would understand not so well. So that's not a solution. Right? We need someone to mediate. Uh, did you connect to particular theory? Just I'd like to know about your theoretical framework a little bit. Uh, anyways. Theoretical framework. Thank so, you. so as I said at the beginning, I primarily drew on cognitive linguistics as a, as a communication theory. So this idea of the, the, the association between language and conceptualization. So by studying um, linguistic um, samples, we can then get an insight into the conceptualization instantiated by those uh, examples in the minds of the users. So when somebody says more is, if somebody says, oh, uh, the, the, the red is higher than green, the th theoretically I'm thinking, I'm, I believe that that means in their mind they are conceptualizing um, risk um, as denoted by color as being higher than lower. Right? So that would be, I suppose, the theoretical basis I drew upon um, for the assessment. Um, and I've already talked about corpus linguistics, but that's much more of a, I, I suppose that's more, less of a theoretical basis, but more of a methodological tool that I applied, right? So it's more a way of getting at data. But it is, I suppose, theoretically, resting on the idea that quantification means important, right? So if we, by counting stuff, it means that this is important, right? So there is that sense, I suppose, um, in terms of uh, a theoretical approach as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, different angles, uh, especially uh, from a linguist perspective, uh, public communication, uh, especially for extreme weather events. Uh, my question is, uh, number or color, what is what is uh, more effective for uh, well, your communicating with uh, the uh, Silati Bangladesh diaspora? Uh, another uh, thing is, uh, uh, recently I visited uh, Bashkali Upajala, you know, uh, uh, under Chiron district. Chotogram uh, is now. So uh, there, number higher is uh, uh, more uh, risky. So number seven is more risky. Uh, number uh, five, six, seven yes. in cyclone warning is same actually. Just yes. the direction is um, a difference. And number eight, nine, and ten is same actually. But they have very complexity about the number. They yes. know that. Five, uh, six is higher than five, seven is higher than six. That is not true actually in Bangladesh. That's, that's the major complexity in cyclone warning in Bangladesh. So I, uh, my question is, uh, for my uh, learning, what is the best option, color or uh, <laughs> number? I think, um, I don't think that that works. 
um, particularly cross-culturally. I think the idea of color, colors don't work because you need to know the system. You need to know the colors, unless everybody is culturally familiar with these colors. I think everybody would associate red with, 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 with a high level of risk because that's in nature. We, you know, red things are dangerous. Um, we learn that. Um, I think that's, that's kind of universal. But the idea of amber um, being, being sort of risky and yellow being quite risky, that's, that's very abstract. Um, so that's problematic. I think um, using numbers, as you pointed out, numbers can go either way. So number one could be the highest risk, or it could be the lowest risk. Depends if you're factoring in number magnitude, right? So that's also potentially misleading. Um, so I think this idea, if, we're trying, if we want, to, we need to strip things back to, to more situational understanding. So I think if we're going to have a tiered warning system, why not just three levels, right? Um, you know, uh, middle, high risk, medium risk, low risk. Okay, there can be a more nuanced system for if we're talking about infrastructure, because emergency workers, for instance, need to have a nuanced understanding of risk. That's different. But we can simplify that system, right? Um, potentially, you could use color as a semiotic, but you could also use uh, phrases, right? So a level one, so, uh, so if we say top, le top level risk, right? Okay, we could say danger, uh, you know, level, um, you know, level red, code red, danger, right? Code, uh, and then the second level, uh, uh, um, we could just use the term warning, and then we'd add, um, let's say, uh, um, be prepared or, or take uh, a preparatory action. Right? And for the lowest level, we could say no risk. Right? So, so I don't think number works unless you're familiar with the system already. That's the problem with scales. They all have a normative character, so you need to know what's at the top. And I think we need to develop messages that are tied with some sort of advice. Yeah? So they have that in the UK. They have things like take action, be prepared, emergency. But we need to test which, which phrase sort of uh, is most commonly associated with which level. So does emergency for everyone mean the same thing? Of course it doesn't, so that's more problematic, again. Right? So, but when we start using verbs, it becomes a bit more situational, a bit easier. And we can do that in a scaled way, but that needs testing, I think. Yeah. So the, answer, the long answer to your very good question is, I'm not sure, uh, but we need to test it. I, think we need to, I don't think number or colour really works on its own unless there's familiarity with the system. If there's cultural familiarity with the system, colour works well. Everybody understands traffic lights, for instance. Right? Most people understand traffic lights. But then again, they're different colours. Yeah, colour perception varies as well, according to whether it's in Japan, blue is seen as green. You know, it's, it's, it's confusing. Okay? Um, are there uh, any other questions? Uh, Sorry, you worked did. with two age groups, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, what was the role of uh, the age in, in perceiving uh, all these science systems and other linguistic systems? Good question. I had to gloss over that. I uh, made this division in the presentation, the simplicity between the English assessment and the, um, the adaptive version of the assessment for all the Bangladeshis. So I should reiterate that the English assessment included uh, the young Bangladeshis. Right. They were able to, as all the other participants in the study from the white British part of the community, um, and, they, um, and, the, and the findings were very similar. We could actually group them separately. Right? So I would group the young uh, Bangladeshi interpretations of risk uh, alongside the young white British interpretations, the older white British interpretations. They understood that colours mapped onto risk, for instance. Okay? So there is, a, there is a big role for age in when it came to the Bangladeshi community, but not for the white British community. Um, there, there was a lot of cultural similarity. Um, okay? And in fact, we see a, the younger Bangladeshis, uh, in terms of their, ex because they've, they've all been exposed to scientific discourse and education system. Right? We, know, uh, we know, for instance, if you hear the term chest infection, right? we know without any, any information given to us that chest is locative, chest is inside, that the infection is inside your chest. So we've read other things like, um, we know a foot infection, right? We know that if you have a word before infection, it, 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 it means it's locative, right? And that's because we've had experience. But if you haven't got experience of that, chest infection might not make sense, right? Uh, infection of the, you know, it, it, pain in your chest is how they interpret it, right? It's, chest infection is not chest infection, but pain in your chest. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. So at this point, I would like to call upon stage Professor Dr. Shaila Sultana, an eminent scholar of our country, to deliver her vote of thanks. Yes, okay.
um, applied linguistics, a, very, a discipline very much close to my heart. And whenever I think about applied linguistics, I think about three aspects, and I always tell this to my students. That is, uh, applied linguistics should be done with rigor. That is, whenever we look into the language, we should have such a meticulous description of the language that, that we can understand the relationship between language and different social dynamics. And I also say to my students that applied linguistics research should be done with rigor and uh, attitude. And what is this attitude? Attitude is, uh, is the attitude to bring some changes to the society and um, to give power to those people who are marginalized, who are disempowered for language and uh, for various uh, issues in relation to language. And the third thing that I tell my students is that applied linguistics is not only ELT. This is a very common belief that we have, that whenever we talk about applied linguistics, it is only about ELT, it's not. There's so many areas of research in applied linguistics that need attention. And in today's presentation, in fact, we see how all these aspects of applied linguistics can be done uh, in one single research, that is applied linguistics research with rigor, with attitude, and in other disciplines. And thanks to Kristen uh, for showing us, specifically our research students who are new in the field and who are looking for different avenues of research. And perhaps by attending this, work, uh, this seminar and later on the workshop, um, they will have certain ideas about you know, how to do applied linguistics research going beyond English language teaching. I have huge respect to English language teaching because I'm, I myself is an English language teacher. But at the same time, I see the necessity of doing uh, other areas of research, you know, doing research in other areas. For example, discourse analysis. He has shown how discourse analysis, in fact, can be used, um, or corpus linguistics can be used for applied linguistics research. Uh, meanwhile, thank you very much for coming. I hope that you, you have learned something by attending this uh, seminar and do something with it. All right. Thank you, Shala Susana, madam, and thank you, Chris. And here comes the end of today's seminar. We would love to have this kind of seminar again with Mr. Chris in future. Thank you all for coming.